one major concept at coming out of statics is the notion of a free body diagram. That whole idea that we're going to take some sort of structure or some sort of thing that we're interested in and we are going to strip away its supports and create a model that is the free body diagram that represents the forces that are imposed upon that body. So we might start with this bike example, for instance, with the self-weight of the rider that has two contact points, the seat as well as the handlebar strips. And in addition here, we might have also a uh, backward sliding action of the seat of the person on the saddle of the bike itself. Those would be, in some sense, most of the applied loads. One more, though, that would be common, of course, would be the foot force on the pedal, and predominantly the uh, front pedal. There may be something going on in the rear pedal, but we'll focus on a, a, um, just what's happening here on the, the primary applied forces, so to speak. And because we've removed the, the roadway, which is the support for this particular structure, then we need to put those contact forces. Remember, then uh, we'll have forces that are normal to that surface that we've pulled away. And then we'll have um, different frictional forces, one for this front wheel, which a force that is, is inducing this to rotate. And if the, the bike is moving forward at a steady rate, meaning no acceleration, then um, that's, of course, direction is left to right. That means the, the wheel, front wheel, has to be rotating in this U in a clockwise fashion, and it is the friction force on the road that is causing that to happen. The rear wheel is different because it's the drive wheel. None, none of the forces that we have really shown on here actually propel the bike forward or keep it going at a steady rate. And it's the drive wheel and the friction on from the, the drive wheel that, uh, as in the friction of the drive wheel on the road, that creates that propelling force forward. And that oftentimes is not intuitive to, to folks. They think of the freely rotating wheel and that the friction that's causing it to rotate, that makes sense, but they forget about that, hey, in order for this to actually work, that you're putting the, the moment with this force applied to the uh, front pedal, that creates a, uh, a torque around the crankshaft, and the crankshaft's connected to the chain, and the chain is then trying to drive this rear wheel in a clockwise fashion, and since it's trying to drive it in a clockwise fashion, you have to have the friction down here that will resist that motion, and then that pushes it forward. And so big difference between the free wheel, the friction is causing the wheel to rotate in the front, whereas in the back, it's all about that this friction is actually what is propelling the bike forward. Right? Now that's a free body diagram of the entire structure, but we can also then begin to peel this apart into small little pieces. For instance, if we go back to the seat post and we had the self-weight of a portion of the body, the rider, to the saddle, as well as potentially a rearwards directed force, um, then when we go and cut the seat post, now it's going to function a bit like a beam, which means when we cut members in two dimensions, they have three possible non-zero internal resultants, an axial force, a potential shear force and then a bending moment. These are all three of these are internal forces to this structure. Whereas the one that we were looking at before were all external, um, so to speak. These are now we're exposing the internal forces in our structure. In a similar kind of fashion when we go look at say the handlebar and those grips and we had that the force being <coughs> pushed down upon by the rider's arms, that when we go to cut the, uh, the, the uh, front post assembly, this little bracket that comes out, notice that this plane is now a vertical plane rather than being a cross-sectional plane. And it doesn't matter. It still means that we still have three internal resultants. We won't call them shear axial and bending moment um, in exactly the same kind of way anymore. Instead, we'll represent that as a normal force on that plane and some sort of a shear force on that plane. And then yes, we will have a bending moment uh, as well. But different axes, 
It's just that this normal force is no longer coinciding with the longitudinal axis of the uh, cut piece, so it's no longer an axial force. And this shear force that's represented here is not exactly the same shear force as we had before um, in terms of the, um, the, the angle of it. But these two could be resolved if we wanted to into a line of action that are along the long axis of this bracket and the perpendicular axis of the bracket. So really they're the same thing. Uh, there sometimes is more convenient to represent it in this format as opposed to the other one depending on uh, what the uh, how we're representing the applied forces on that particular object. And then there is the frame itself. Right? So before we get to the free body here, let's illustrate the part that we want to really get to, which is this part of the frame. So we have, we're going to remove the rear wheel, we're going to remove the uh, sprocket assembly, front sprocket assembly, we're also going to remove all of the handlebar and uh, front fork assembly here, leaving us with a system that looks an awful lot like a truss, although it does have some small little kinds of changes to it, particularly at that front bracket assembly area where the front fork goes through. We don't have the front, the top tube and the down tube um, coming together at a point, but rather they uh, have a short little bracket or post that's uh, going in there. And as we start to begin to look at what happens on this body, this frame, then when we pull the uh, front pedal or sprocket assembly, that is a bearing type situation. So we're going to have only two sets of forces, and we can represent those as two orthogonal ones, right? Pull a pin, and we have two forces that are uh, there. Same thing with pulling the pin, which is the um, axle at the rear wheel. And I'm not showing them the way I think they physically act. I'm just putting two in there for right now. And at the seat post uh, location on the frame, I'm going to take the opposite values of the internal forces because I happen to cut this at exactly the same kinds of place. So I'll have that shear force and uh, the then compressive force from the seat post and the bending moment. All of these now equal but opposite directions because when we, if we were to paste these two things back together, they have to vectorially disappear because they are internal to the system. Right? In a similar kind of way up here um, at the, the front bracket associated with the handlebars, we might have, again, a set that we turn around to represent what happens coming from the handlebars. And what we haven't done yet is represented what happens <coughs> excuse me, from the front fork on the bottom, which because of its bearing, um, it, its uh, ball bearings or its, its ring that allows that thing to rotate, we'll get a different set of uh, potential internal forces here. But in 2D, they would look uh, something of this kind of nature. I know we don't have to have these in directly the exact right um, directions because uh, whatever our math will do, if we're consistent with this free body diagram, we'll get minus signs and then we'll know that we chose in exactly the opposite direction. Again, big key concept in statics is how to draw free body diagrams.